We've been in this cave system for three days now. Rations packed were for five. So the math doesn't look great. Not for eating on the way out anyway. Wouldn't it be the first time you went a few days without food? That is, if you find the lair today, if you ever get out, you decide to be the one to ask that hard question. Uh, Captain, maybe we should think about finding our way out of here? I will pretend I did not hear that from you, my fighting friend. From the warlock, I expect that kind of worry. Well, he is right, Captain. It's been three days. You see? Now you have got him started. What part of Horde do you two not understand? The cleric and the rogue get it. Horde is fine, Cap, but uh, you have to be alive to enjoy it. I concur with the warrior. We should consider an exit strategy. I have considered the exit strategy. We will exit after we slay this dragon and take its horde. Now both of you consider shutting your mouths and watch the flanks. Capley, it's been three days. Ah, uh, my warlock friend that we have nicknamed the dog. Why do you purr so much? Capley, what? Stop being a pussy and earn your keep for once. Or we change nickname. That's when the whispers start. Uh, that seems bad. Now you too, Cleric. It is just the wind. We have to be a few thousand feet underground. What when? As if on cue, all of your torches dim as a cold breeze pushes through the cavern. Told you, kitty cat. Wind. The whispers return tenfold as the cavern opens up into an enormous undefined space. Your torchlight flickers onto the massive pile of coins and gems. Ah, you see? More wealth than you could shake your cowardly dick at. <laughs> you all share a laugh at the warlock's expense, and then the breeze and whispers crescendo to a roar. It wasn't the wind. Today on Hawk Soup, we will delve into the dragon soul end of things with a haunt hazard deep dive into the ever ethereal whimsical waters of the unusual undead as we close in on that pagan holiday where everyone plays dress up and encourages the next generation to the path of diabetes. As everyone starts to dig out their festive decorations and break out all those godforsaken pumpkin spice products, feel free to hit the comment section with some of the more annoying or strange pumpkin flavored nonsense that you will endure over the next two months or even something you found amazing with that pumpkin rubbed all over it. But I digress. Today we will talk about ghost dragons, like Busey's buttery sausage, where they come from, what they are doing, why they have to get all up in your face and give you that honey death kiss on the lips. Now ghost dragons, not to be confused with ghost peppers, those will ruin your ass and taste buds if improperly proportioned in your salsa. <laughs> Shout out to Marco. No, ghost dragons can, depending upon the variant, do far worse things. Cobalt Press has a version, as does Dungeons and & Dragons and Pathfinder. Well, in uh, Creature Codex, they're described as the wrath of dragons. The ghost dragon's creation does not differ greatly from the creation of a human ghost. Dragons of any size, color, or magical ability can become ghost dragons. If the circumstances of the dragon's demise are troubling or violent enough, the soul may be denied an afterlife, leaving the ghost dragon spirit to haunt the material plane until it finds peace. Nice plot there for a one shot. Dragons whose wrathful natures are more intense than others are more likely to become ghost dragons, tied to lairs. Most ghost dragons are bound to the area where they once laired. They may be able to roam within a mile or two of those places, but their unfinished business generally involves a notable event in their lairs. Debts at the hands of sneaky adventurers, which aren't they all, betrayal by their followers, machinations of a rival dragon, etc. The ghost dragon may call upon the powers of its lair for a short time after its mortal death, but soon its lair's powers and actions fade. This tends to enrage the ghost dragon even more. 
undead nature, the ghost dragon does not require air, food, drink, or sleep. Now, Wizards of the Coast, being who they are, went with a more wealth-based version in their latest version of the ghost dragon. Money, money, money. A dragon's attachment to a horde can be strong enough to bind a dragon spirit to existence after death. Such a ghost dragon haunts the horde, often forming an attachment to a single priceless object that becomes the focus of the ghost dragon's undead existence. A ghost dragon is a translucent and incorporeal version of the original dragon. Though its breath weapon resembles ghostly flames, lightning, or acid, it carries an otherworldly curse. The breath's shadowy mist can induce walking nightmares. Talk about needing a breath mint. We can go with a combo of both or add in some of the older lore found nicely summarized by the Forgotten Realms fandom. Drago Comic Con. In the Drago Comic Con, it lends itself to a ghost dragon as a powerful type of ghost created when a dragon is slain and its horde looted. Ghost dragons haunt their former lairs unable to rest until their hordes are restored. In the 1996 Monstrous Compendium Annual Volume 3, and in the 1998 Cult of the Dragon, or the 2001 Monsters of Faerun, they say a ghost dragon resembled the dragon as it was in life, except far more terrifying. Their forms were translucent and composed of swirling sinister shadows. Only the most powerful of dragons have the strength of will to persist as ghosts. And as such, many dragon ghosts are already of an ancient age and size by the time of their deaths. Normally, they dwelt within the ethereal plane entirely, both being invisible and incorporeal. But they could manifest themselves at will to become visible on the material plane, but remain incorporeal. They communicated entirely in whispers. I get it. Ghost dragons were too powerful to be created via necromancy and instead attained undeath by being bound to their hordes in a manner far more profound than by mere greed. Ah, see, that's better. It's more of an intrinsic motivation to an external haunt, or some would say unlife. This may be a better way to go for those dragon liches. Just form a special bond with that treasure, but, uh, you know, don't make it weird. Some form particularly strong attachments to a specific priceless treasure that then became the focus of their undeath. Most often, ghost dragons had been killed while defending their lairs and could only find peace if their stolen hoard was returned. It was generally not necessary for the exact treasure to be returned, and a hoard of equivalent value was usually enough to placate a ghost dragon, although some had more particular requirements as well. Damn it. I guess it is just a money thing. As long as a treasure of equal or greater value is presented, well, you know, then it's all fine. When its treasures were restored, the dragon would curl up on top of the treasure and disappear into the afterlife, thanking anyone who had aided it. Aw, oh, that's beautiful. There were conflicting reports as to whether or not the treasure always remained behind to be claimed by others, or it would too vanish alongside the ghosts. That would be a clever way to piss off that treasure horror party. That is without a doubt. Although ghost dragons retain many of the traits that identified the breed of dragon that they were before their deaths, they do not retain their breath weapons. Instead, they breathe a cone of gray mist which sometimes took the form of a ghostly parody of the breath weapon in life, such as flames or lightning or acid, which sap vitality from any creature in its path. This mist was paralyzingly cold and could induce nightmarish hallucinations and physical weakness, but the real danger was that anyone caught in a breath weapon would begin aging rapidly. This aging was proportional to the race's longevity, so humans might find themselves as much as a century older, while elves could find themselves older by a millennium. Ghost dragons were so thoroughly steeped in this kind of magic that even just being near one could cause a creature to age by as many as three decades instantly. A ghost dragon could not be truly destroyed, only released from its undeath, by providing it with the treasure it desired. If defeated and dispersed in combat, a ghost dragon would reform within two to eight days. Dang. Never ending. Ghost dragons were solitary spirits that retained many of their faculties from before their deaths. Although they generally became less aggressive in life, they were deeply attached to their hordes and were fixated on the lost treasure. 
often unable to think about anything else. Nothing could dissuade them or distract them from the goal of acquiring treasure and the loss of their hordes, and their inability to restore them quickly was a constant source of anguish. Ah, the agony. This obsession with... (laughs) This obsession with reclaiming their treasures could make them dangerous as it led to them coveting any and all wealth they could acquire, whether in the form of money, gems, or magic items. Ghost dragons consider any treasure that came into their lair to be part of their hoard, and thus any visitor or trespasser were expected to surrender their wealth immediately as a tith to the dragon. Ghost dragons rarely ambush their trespassers, preferring to make their terrible presence known and offer one chance to submit to the tith. Refusal was met with savagery, while cooperation could earn the ghost's help and knowledge. Those who were especially polite as they handed over all of their treasure and magic would be allowed to keep 10% of their valuables. Now it's starting to sound like the IRS. Many ghost dragons retained an interest in conversation, and given that many existed for centuries, if not millennia, they were a valuable source of historical knowledge. However, any information did not come cheap. Now this would be great to insert in your campaign as a possible medium in your group to lend an ear or put them on a path. Whether that path is correct or not is up to the DM. Now, most adventurers who had encountered a ghost dragon agreed that it is far wiser to submit to its demands for treasure than to fight it. Merely touching a ghost dragon or suffering an attack from their teeth, claws, or tail could drain a creature's life force and cause its strength to wither. An arm or leg struck by a ghost dragon would begin to shrivel, combined with the rapid aging caused by their breath weapon, which most ghost dragons could use three times before needing to take any kind of break, and even then, usually no more than seconds, they were truly terrifying opponents. Although undead ghost dragons could not be turned and were unaffected by holy water, most physical attacks pass straight through them or otherwise could simply not harm them. Most spells cast from the material plane could not affect them, and they were extraordinarily resilient in the face of most magical conditions or efforts to restrain them. Some ghost dragons were known to retain the elemental resistance they had in life. Although they were solitary and mournful spirits, ghost dragons were not completely detached from draconic society. Living dragons would sometimes take pity on their undead brethren and would consider to send them treasure in the form of wealth on wary adventurers. Some ghost dragons also served dwarven gods such as Abathor and Virgadine. Ghost dragons could be found haunting their old lairs, particularly those that were dark, underground, or indoors as spectral undead ghost dragons needed no substance and thus ceased to hunt within their territories. In general, they did not involve themselves with the physical world at all, except perhaps to collect tithes of treasure with which to restore their hordes. The mere presence of a ghost dragon could deplete a region of much of its wealth and magic items. In other instances, ghost dragons could be so closely bound to their hordes that they were unable to leave their lairs, and it was generally understood that it was not in their nature to fly across the land as a living dragon might. Now, of course, the life training version of the ghost dragon might be a bit much for your group. So we got a couple to choose from. You can go with the uh, Cobalt Press one that comes in at a challenge rating of 11 and has multi-attack, of course, with claws, but a withering bite. The withering bite does necrotic damage, so it won't be draining life, but it won't be draining life in the sense of you losing years on each turn. So that uh, the withering bite will be a plus eight to hit, and it'll do two d10 plus four piercing damage. And if you fail on the constitution saving throw, you'll take another four d8 of necrotic damage. The dragon enters the ethereal plane from the material plane or vice versa. It is visible on the material plane while it is in the border ethereal and vice versa, yet it it can't affect or be affected by anything on the other plane. It also has that horrifying breath weapon, and the ghost dragon exhales a blast of icy terror in a 30-foot cone. Each living creature in that area must make a DC-16 wisdom saving throw on a failure. A creature takes 8d10 psychic damage and is frightened for one minute. On a success, it takes half the damage and isn't frightened. Fizzband's version 
is much more ferocious than that. It'll come in as a challenge rating 17. It has incorporeal movement. The ghost dragon can move through other creatures and objects as if they were difficult terrain. It takes 1d10 force damage if it ends its turn inside an object. <laughs> of course, it has legendary resistance. It has that uh, undead nature, so it doesn't require air, food, drink, or sleep. It has the multi-attacks with the bite and two claw attacks, but the terrifying breath weapon, it exhales shadowy mist in a 90-foot cone. Each creature in that area must make a DC 21 constitution saving throw. On a failed save, the creature takes 98 cold damage and is frightened of the ghost dragon for one minute. On a successful save, the creature takes half as much damage and isn't frightened. While frightened of the ghost dragon, a creature is paralyzed. The frightened creature can repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turns. Fizzman's version there would be a lot more terrifying, but not quite as terrifying as it used to be in previous versions of Dungeons & Dragons, where it would literally drain years from your life. Now, some of the history of the ghost dragons and more notable ghost dragons in the Forgotten Realms is in the Year of the Sword in 1365, ghost dragons were spotted flying around the Thunder Peaks. Members of the Cult of Dragons had experience with encountering ghost dragons as they searched old lairs for evil dragons to convert to their cause and make, you know, dragon liches. By the mid to late 14th century DR, it was a common practice to try and steer agents of the cult's enemies, such as the Harpers of the Zentarium, into ghost dragons' lairs in order to eliminate them while appeasing the spirit's need for treasure. Some cultists worked to help ghost dragons find peace so they would pass on, and the cult could then claim the treasure and refurbish the lair for their own nefarious purposes. In the year of the Tankard, 1370 DR, they were sending caravans of treasure to the lair of the deceased white dragon Galantatra. <laughs> nice name hoping to claim her strategically located lair near the high gap between the fallen lands, the lands of the Delimbri Vale. During the Rage of Dragons in the Year of the Rogue Dragons, 1373 DR, a ghost dragon rose in the vicinity of Dracaridge Mithril. In Skelcor on a bear, the wrath-like Ranthria were sometimes called ghost dragons by the local dragonborn. Now some of the more notable ghost dragons, like we said before, the white dragon Galantatra became a ghost dragon when she and the beholder Thalul slew each other in her maze-like lair in the Great Peak Mountains north of the High Gap. The copper dragon Halantathalir was slain in the year of Whelm 1290 DR and his horde and wormlings were taken from his lair beneath Dragonspear Castle that you'll find in the Cult of the Dragon book and the Dragons of Faerun. The Silver Dragon Mirin was bound to protect Candlekeep by powerful magic. When she was slain in the Year of the Tomb, 1182 DR, this magic continued to bind her spectral form to Candlekeep, and in this state she was sometimes referred to as the Ghost Dragon, and that's in the uh, Anaruk, the Empire of Shade, there's also the mighty red dragon, Ragflakashin, <laughs> nice name, I'm sure I'm butchering that pronunciation, was killed by Abathor, the dwarven god of greed, who then plundered the worm's lair himself. Now the dragon's spirit persisted, and his ghost haunted his old lair beneath Turnback Mountain as the year of the awakening. 1001 DR, when yeah, when Abathor directed his faithful to restore the dragon's horde, this allowed him to pass on, leaving his old lair to become a temple to Abathor known as Afarn. And that particular story is in the Demi-Humans and Deities book from 1998. And then finally, good old Ed Greenwood in 2001, in The Adventures of Volo, The Urge to Hunt, in... Sembia, rich merchants would pay good money to participate in an annual hunt for a mythic ghost called the Dark Dragon, which in fact did not exist. Now, please haunt that like and subscribe buttons and drop a comment, even if it's just boo or minx and boo, and we will see you real soon with some more monstery goodness. Until then, 
Stay frosty and aware, beautiful people, and question everything. And whoever might need to hear it, uh, you are loved. Remember, we're all a little lost on the same damn road, so uh, hang in there. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>